thousands of Australians being watched by a Chinese company with links to Beijing's military intelligence networks. COVID-19 cases soar around the world while Australia's infection rate eases. Shinzo Abe's right-hand man set to succeed him as Japan's next Prime Minister. And coming up on the business, it's just too strict. Vaccine maker CSL's boss pleased with the Victorian government to rerun the numbers and lift the curfew. Hello, welcome to ABC News. I'm Karina Cavallo. The world has been given a glimpse of the extent of China's cyber interest in millions of foreigners, including tens of thousands of Australians. The leaked data is being held in bulk storage. It's revealed details about politicians, their children, scientists and singers. The information represents only a small portion of what's collected by an outfit with links to Beijing's military and intelligence operations. Here's political editor Andrew Proben. Shenzhen's transformation maps China's rise. Once a sleepy fishing village, it's now a glittering technology hub, home to the headquarters of a mass surveillance program. And seeking to influence and control not just their own citizens, but citizens around the world. It is gathering a lot of headlines. Chris Balding, an American economics professor who worked in China for nine years, was leaked a massive database from a Shenzhen firm. At the time, to be honest, I really did not realize what I was coming into possession of. I was by far the largest uh, surveillance system or open source intelligence system that I'd ever encountered. Canberra-based cybersecurity expert Robert Potter was recruited to restore it. He found two and a half million people were being tracked, including 35,000 Australians, a few hundred of them given particular attention. An eclectic who's who of business, politics, policy and entertainment. Atlassian billionaire Mike Cannon-Brooks among them. The former ambassador to China, Jeff Raby, one-time foreign minister Bob Carr and singer Natalie Imbruglia. Much of the information was scraped from online accounts, but the company that was harvesting it, Zhenhua Data, was in some cases able to get addresses, marital status and even confidential bank records. There could be a range of uh, sinister and benign reasons, some of which we, w we may not know for some time. Little is known of Junhua Data's mission, but its chief executive, Wang Xiaofeng, a former IBM employee, may have offered a hint. He's written at length about waging hybrid war, a constant state of conflict using all forces in peacetime, including invisible warfare for political purposes to sow dissension, create disruption. Academic Clive Hamilton's been poring over the database for weeks. CSIRO is really a prime target for uh, China's intelligence services. In one instance, equipment from the Commonwealth Science and Research Agency was tracked being dispatched from the Tidbin Billa Deep Space Centre outside Canberra to the United States. And it went to 4800 Oak Grove Drive, Pasadena, which happens to be the uh, that's Na NASA, isn't that's it? NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. China's certainly not alone in scouring the internet for sensitive information. But what's so startling is the sheer scale of the operation and the fact the company is an advocate for data being weaponized for military and intelligence purposes. A digital cold war on democracy. Andrew Probin, ABC News, Canberra. A few simple pleasures have returned to the lives of many Victorians with the easing of a handful of restrictions. The numbers continue to head in the right direction with 35 new cases and a further seven deaths. The government has released details on this summer's shift to outdoor dining and explained how it'll help the hospitality industry make the changes. Simon Hartley has run Melbourne institution Beko for nearly 25 years. Hi, Chef. Can I get two Beko rolls? He's relying on takeaway and has seen sales crash by 90%. Like so many in the business, he's desperate to reopen, even if that means outdoor dining. Anything will help at the moment. To get us back on track, to get the city back on track, uh, to get people coming back into the city when they're allowed, we're going to need a lot of energy. In New York and London, tables have taken over roads and footpaths, and Premier Daniel Andrews wants Melbourne to follow their lead. 
If it works, I'd love to. Yeah, I think it could look really good. I don't know how permanent we could do it. The state has announced a $290 million package to help. The fund includes almost $90 million for councils and businesses outside the CBD to pay for outdoor furniture, safety screens and training. 11,000 businesses with a payroll of less than $3 million will be eligible. Business in the CBD has been smashed by COVID, so another $100 million for the city has been set aside. It includes $30 million for equipment and remodelling, $30 million to create COVID safe events to attract visitors back to the city and $40 million for physical street improvements, including wider footpaths. We may see some streets closed, some laneways closed. We may see some public space, so parks and gardens that are adjacent to uh, significant numbers of uh, restaurants and pubs, venues like that, that may well be uh, transformed. Industry says this won't be an easy change and some have even labelled the idea as far-fetched, especially given Melbourne's fickle weather. The sector has also highlighted the relative success of indoor dining with density limits between lockdowns as a reason to get drinkers and diners back inside sooner. The state is also opening up the checkbook for sole traders, offering $3,000 grants for creative industries, outdoor entertainment and gym owners. We'll take any financial assistance as possible as we can get, um, but it's not a great deal, but I'm not going to be ungrateful about it, of course. Melbourne's all-important fortnightly average edged closer to the 50 needed to open on September 28. In regional Victoria, there are 47 active cases, but no new infections today. And with an average below four, a further easing of the rules could be announced as early as tomorrow. Richard Willingham, ABC News, Melbourne. Health authorities in New South Wales are worried complacency about coronavirus is beginning to creep in. The number of tests done each day has dropped below 10,000 for the first time in months. That's prompting renewed calls for people to stay vigilant as the government focuses on new ways to reinvigorate Sydney's nightlife. Scenes like these are a distant memory for the city's night owls. The lockouts had just been lifted and then Sydney was plunged into COVID lockdown. Now there's a new plan to revive the city's nightlife and reopen Sydney 24-7. We should be having rooftop bars. We want to increase our hours. We want to increase public transport. We want to look at ways in which we can get our city the best city in the world. In an era of coronavirus restrictions, that can seem a long way off. New South Wales has recorded four new cases of COVID-19 but it's a large drop in testing numbers that has both sides of politics concerned. None of us can let our guard down. Remember, we let our guard down earlier in the year and then the Victorian situation arose completely unexpectedly. Uh, and we have to accept that until there's a vaccine, every day is a battle. That shows that the community may be starting to think we're out over this, that testing is absolutely critical in our battle against coronavirus. And the battle over international arrivals goes on. The Premier is calling on other states to allow more flights after Sydney took in extra Australians who were fleeing Beirut following a deadly blast. In recent weeks we did take some extra flights, so the cap was exceeded um, with my blessing to, to make sure that Australians from Lebanon and other places who, for humanitarian reasons, had to come out here. So we have made exceptions already. Newmarch House has had a fresh scare following a fatal outbreak a few months ago. An email from the aged care home says a resident went to hospital and tested positive yesterday and then returned to Newmarch House. A second test has come back negative and authorities are now waiting for the result of a third test. In the state's north, authorities in Byron Bay are telling schoolies to stay away. What they used to think uh, schoolies was like at Byron Bay is just not going to occur this year. Unfortunately, we can't allow it. Get your, get your hands up. And gatherings exceeding 20 people are still not allowed. Police can now find anyone breaking that rule $1,000. Rani Heyman, ABC News, Sydney. The Queensland Premier has declared she's ready to lose the upcoming election over her coronavirus health response. Anastasia Palaszczuk won't back down on border and medical exemptions despite recent pressure. The attacks over the response have now reached the state's chief health officer, who's received death threats. The Premier needs no protection from her opponent's attacks on borders and medical exemptions, ready to stake her reputation and political future on her COVID response, even if it's unpopular. 
Now, if it means I have to lose the election, I will risk all that if it means keeping Queensland is safe. The Premier has continually deferred criticism around tough border restrictions to the Chief Health Officer, but now that independent public servant has become a target in an increasingly politicised debate. Facing death threats, police are now stationed outside her home. It has taken an enormous toll on me, but then this has taken an enormous toll on nearly every single person in our community. And while the government has rallied around the bureaucrat... Well, it makes me feel sad, but um, none of us asked to be in these roles. The opposition is demanding the Premier accept responsibility for all COVID decisions. It is not good enough for the Premier of Queensland to continue to hide behind the decisions of the Chief Health Officer. The buck stops with the Premier. Dr Young says the need for tough borders is still necessary as more is learned about the COVID virus. It affects every single cell in the body and leaves long-lasting problems for different organs in the body. But on the home front there is good news with another day of zero new coronavirus cases and the Chief Health Officer's says if the state reaches two weeks COVID free, she'll recommend easing the 10 person gathering limit in and outside of homes. People feel that our latest outbreak's under control. It's not. I hope it is, but it's too early to say it definitely is. We're now on day two of that countdown. Alison Horn, ABC News, Brisbane. The Northern Territory has been declared clinically free of coronavirus, but authorities expect there will be new cases. The Territory Government is also in discussions with the Commonwealth about whether or not Darwin's quarantine facility could be used to house stranded Australians when they return from overseas. As the count for interstate arrivals at Northern Territory borders ticks towards 71,000. Today we're expecting just under 1,000 passengers to come through um, Darwin International Airport. Another milestone has arrived, a declaration that coronavirus has, for now, been eradicated in the Territory. This means there's been two replication cycles, or 28 days, since the last recovered case. We mustn't become complacent. I believe we will see coronavirus in the Northern Territory, but we're well prepared. It's not the first time the Territory's been coronavirus free. This also happened in June. But a few more cases were found among the US Marines and a family who went to Melbourne for medical treatment, who've now recovered. Going forward, uh, we will hopefully on October 9th, on the advice of the Chief Health Officer, remove that hotspot declaration for Metropolitan Sydney. There are also suggestions Darwin's Howard Springs facility could be used to quarantine Australians stranded overseas. About a 1,000 people are isolating there now, but there's capacity for 3,000. So those conversations are continuing, but we've seen uh, the arrival of those uh, seasonal workers um, from Vanuatu, and uh, my understanding is that that's gone very smoothly. But when it comes to the $2,500 quarantine price tag, although it's acknowledged this does not reflect the true cost and it's less than some other jurisdictions, there are no current plans to increase it. Felicity James, ABC News. The former Prime Minister Paul Keating wants to see a HEC-style loan scheme to cover the spiralling costs of aged care. Appearing at the Royal Commission, Mr Keating suggested the government could give loans to elderly Australians that would be paid back by their estate after they die. Anne Connolly reports. Australia's rapidly ageing population calls for drastic measures. Aged care services are essential human services and they're services on which more than a million people rely. Yet despite over $20 billion a year of taxpayer funding going to the sector, the Aged Care Royal Commission has heard that there's no transparency on how that money is spent. Some providers achieve high profit margins while others are making losses under the same funding and regulatory framework. Home care providers also benefit. The Royal Commission heard they hold more than $1 billion in taxpayer funds. That's despite a waiting list of over 100,000 elderly people needing home care. It's something former Prime Minister Paul Keating, the architect of the country's superannuation scheme, gave evidence about today. Why would somebody need to wait 36 months for a level four package or 24 months? These are aged people, you know, they're likely to die in the period. 
Mr Keating also suggested a Hextile loan scheme to help fund aged care for elderly Australians. One of many